Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. In the last video, we talked about how we choose what form a trial wave function should have. We saw that a wave function can be estimated using hydrogen wave functions, Slater-type orbitals, or a sum of Gaussian curves. Actually, a trial wave function can be anything at all, even something as simple as a simple sine wave but our calculations will give much more accurate results if the trial wave function bears some resemblance to the real wave function. And these three types of trial wave function are similar to real wave functions in some important ways, as we saw in the last video. Once we've chosen a good trial wave function, we can use it in the Schrodinger equation to find the approximate energy, or find the expectation value for another property we're interested in for the system. But once we've done that, what's next? We know that the trial wave function isn't the same as the real one, so the energy or other property that we've calculated won't quite be correct. Is there any way we can improve the trial wave function so that our calculations yield better results? The answer is yes, and that's what I want to tell you about today. There are many different methods we can use to improve the wave function, and we'll look at two of them today. The first, and by far the most common, is called the Hartree-Fock method. It was named for the two physicists who developed it in 1935, Douglas Hartree in England and Vladimir Fock in Russia. Here's how it works. Suppose our system is a molecule, and we don't know the locations of the nuclei in the molecule. In that case, we wouldn't know what the potential field generated by the nuclei is quite like. In that case, we wouldn't know the potential energy, V, that the electrons in the molecule would have. The Hartree-Fock method is a technique we can use to calculate the approximate locations of the nuclei, the wave function of the system, the form of the Hamiltonian for the system, and the potential energy. The Hartree-Fock method uses a set of calculations that are performed in a cycle. Each time the cycle is performed, the wave function, Hamiltonian, and energy that are calculated are a little more accurate. Therefore, the more times we run through this cycle of calculations, the closer these quantities are to their true values. This type of process, in which each cycle of calculations yields a more accurate result, and is used as the starting point for the next cycle, is known as an iterative process. So, how do we perform the Hartree-Fock method? The first step is to create a trial wave function. As we saw in the last video, the trial wave function is often composed of several hydrogen wave functions, Slater-type orbitals, or sums of Gaussian curves. We now use the trial wave function to calculate the potential energy due to the repulsion between the electrons. For example, if our system were a helium atom, there are just two electrons. So to get the potential energy due to the repulsion, we'd solve this equation. Let's think about where this equation came from. You might remember that the expectation value of a property can be calculated using this integral, where the term in between the two wave functions is the operator for the property we're calculating. The symbol d tau is called the volume element, and as we've seen before, it's equal to r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi in spherical coordinates. In our example, we're calculating the property v rep, which is the potential energy due to the repulsion between the electrons. This term is the operator for that repulsion. Where did that come from? Well, from video 18, we saw that the Hamiltonian for a helium atom looks like this. As you might remember, the Hamiltonian is the operator we use to find the energy of a system. And the part that describes the repulsion between the electrons is this term. If we rewrite this term using atomic units, all the constants drop out, and it looks like this. And that's exactly what we have in the integral we're solving in order to find the potential energy due to repulsion. So, when we solve this integral, we'll have an approximate energy for the electron repulsion. But wait, why is it only approximate? Well, remember 
the energy we get is being calculated using a trial wave function, not the real wave function. So the energy we get is bound to be slightly incorrect. The next step in the Hartree-Fock method is to use the energy we just calculated as the last term in the Hamiltonian. That gives us an approximation to the Hamiltonian that we'll call H effective. Now that we have that, we can use this modified Hamiltonian to solve the Schrodinger equation. Here's a shorthand way of writing the Schrodinger equation. We have phi for the trial wave function, and the energy is represented using the Greek symbol epsilon. The reason why we're using that instead of the letter E for energy is to remind us that the energy we're getting is an approximate energy, not the true energy of the system, which we would use E for. How exactly do we solve this Schrodinger equation? Well, you might remember that we saw this back in video 24. We make use of the variational principle. Remember, the variational principle says that the energy we get by using a trial wave function is always greater than the energy we get if we used the true wave function. For that reason, our energy will be as close as we can get to the true value if we find the lowest possible value of epsilon for the wave function we're using. And we saw in that video that this means we must try to find the value of z where dE dz is equal to zero. And what is z? Well, as we saw in the last video, z represents the effective nuclear charge. If our trial wave function is composed of 1s hydrogen wave functions, you might remember that these look like this. You can see that z appears in these positions, and also in the Hamiltonian. You might also remember from the last video that if we're using Slater-type orbitals in our trial wave function instead of hydrogen wave functions, the variable we use is given the symbol zeta instead of z, but it still represents the same thing. We can now use the new value of z when we solve the Schrodinger equation and get the overall energy. And we can now put that value of z, or zeta, into our trial wave function. So, we've now gone through one cycle of equations in the Hartree-Fock method. We started with a trial wave function, then used it to calculate the repulsion between electrons in our system, then used that as the last term in the Hamiltonian. We used the Hamiltonian in the Schrodinger equation and found the value of z that gave us the minimum possible energy. Finally, we updated our trial wave function with the new value of z and use that in the Schrodinger equation to find the value of epsilon. But wait, since we now have a slightly better value of z in our trial wave function, we can repeat that whole set of calculations. We'll use the new wave function in the integral we use to find the potential energy due to repulsion. Since the trial wave function is now better, the energy we calculate will be more accurate. When we plug that energy into the Hamiltonian, that'll make the Hamiltonian more accurate too, and so on. So, the Hartree-Fock method consists of a cycle or loop of calculations. We can summarize it in this flowchart. We start by making a trial wave function from a product of hydrogen wave functions, Slater-type orbitals, sums of Gaussian curves, or something else. We use the trial wave function to solve the integral that gives us the expectation value of the potential energy due to the repulsion between electrons. We now use that energy as the last term in the Hamiltonian and plug the Hamiltonian into the Schrodinger equation. We find the overall energy by using the variational principle to find the minimal value of epsilon. This also gives us a new value for z, which we can use to update the trial wave function. We then go all the way back to this step and run through the cycle again. This is what's meant by an iterative calculation, and one of the most important things to know about it is that every time we go through one of these cycles, the change we make to the wave function, the Hamiltonian, and the energy gets smaller and smaller, and the new wave function is the starting point for our next cycle.
One way to think of it is that every time we do a cycle, our trial wave function gets asymptotically closer to the true wave function. We continue running through this cycle until the trial wave function we get at the end of one iteration is nearly the same as it was at the beginning of the iteration. When this happens, we say that we have found a self-consistent field, or SCF. That's the goal of the Hartree-Fock method. So, how similar does the trial wave function need to be at the beginning and end of an iteration in order to justify stopping the calculation cycle? Well, that's where the computational work becomes kind of an art. There's no definitive answer because the trial wave function could continue to improve with smaller and smaller changes in each cycle without ever coming to an end a researcher must decide how small a change in the wave function is acceptable. Usually this means balancing the accuracy of the final result and the time needed for the computation. The more accurate we want the wave function to be, the more cycles will be needed, so the longer the computation will take. The Hartree-Fock method is a common way of approximating the wave function and the properties of a system, but it's far from the only one. We'll just look at one other common way of approximating the properties and wave function of a system. This one is called perturbation theory, and one form of it was developed by the Danish physicist Christian Moller and the American physicist Milton Plesset in 1934. In this method, we recognize the fact that the Hamiltonian we start out with isn't entirely accurate. We call it the ideal Hamiltonian, and give it the symbol h with a superscript 0. Meanwhile, we use the symbol phi with a superscript 0 for the trial wave function we start with. If we use these versions of the Hamiltonian and wave function in the Schrodinger equation, the energy we calculate will be called the ideal energy, and it gets the symbol e with a superscript 0. But we know that these three items are only approximately correct. We now want to make them more accurate, and the first step in doing this is to improve the Hamiltonian. We can do this, for example, by adding another term to the Hamiltonian in order to calculate the repulsion between the electrons more accurately. You can think of this as a correction to the Hamiltonian, which we symbolize using an h with a superscript 1. Another word we often use for this kind of correction is a perturbation. But now that we've added another term to the Hamiltonian, it'll cause a change to the energy we calculate with it. We can determine the size of this change using this equation. Just as we saw earlier, we get the expectation value of the energy correction by solving the integral where the perturbation in the Hamiltonian is the operator in between the two trial wave functions. So, if we solve this integral, we'll have calculated a small correction to the energy, so our approximate energy is now given by adding the ideal energy to the correction. So, we have a correction to the Hamiltonian and a correction to the energy. Now, let's make a correction to the wave function. We do that by writing a Schrodinger equation, where the operator is only the perturbation to the Hamiltonian, and the energy in the equation is only the energy correction. If we then solve for phi, the result is a correction to the wave function. So our overall wave function is now given by this equation. We can now repeat this process it's very possible to make another correction to the Hamiltonian. If we do, we'll have a second perturbation, so our overall Hamiltonian will now look like this. Just as we did before, we can use this perturbation to find another correction to the energy using this equation. Notice that the wave function we're using in this integral is just the correction to the wave function we got in the last cycle. That makes sense because we can think of this as making a correction to the earlier correction. 
So, just like the Hartree-Fock method, we can think of this as a cyclic process, where each cycle gives us another correction to the overall Hamiltonian, energy, and wave function. We can summarize the process using this flowchart. We keep on doing this cycle until we run out of perturbations to make to the Hamiltonian. When we're done, we can calculate the overall energy and the overall wave function. So, how many perturbations can we make to the Hamiltonian? Well, just as was the case with the Hartree-Fock method, each cycle results in a smaller and smaller correction to the Hamiltonian, energy, and wave function. So, we have to balance the need for accuracy with the time required for the calculation. Usually, two, three, or four perturbations are used, but it's quite possible to do more. Studies using up to 13 perturbations to the Hamiltonian have been published, but it's actually very rare to use more than five, because the calculations become very time-consuming after that. If we use two correction terms in the Hamiltonian, this process is called second-order perturbation theory. In the same way, if we use three correction terms, it's called third-order perturbation theory, and so on. Well, that's enough new material for today. Now that you've learned about these two approximation methods, you know about some useful tools that researchers use all the time in modern scientific work. In the next video, we'll start looking at some of the results that we get using these tools, and we'll see that we can learn a lot about the way atoms bond to one another and how orbitals combine when we form covalent bonds. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week.